Praise the Lord. Everybody read from the book of Psalms 118 verse 8 right from the middle of the word of God, the middle of the Bible. And it says, Psalms 118 verse 8, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Amen. You may be seated. Verse 9, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. And this is the middle of the Bible and I would like to take it to, uh, I believe it's Psalms 20 also, verse 7, which is, I believe the last verse of the of Psalms 20, Psalms 20. Verse 7, and verse 8, it ends up to 9. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. This is the message of the Word of God that we should put our trust in God and not in man. Every person who trusts man is accursed and every person who puts his trust in the Lord is blessed. It, it says it all and we should never ever trust man and always when we refer to such expressions, we should always mean what we say and say what we mean. And also, uh, we cannot explain always what we exactly mean from all angles of interpretation. But uh, keep the main thing the main thing. We should not trust in man. That doesn't mean we shouldn't trust our father or mother if they have been uh, faithful in the past and uh, they are showing their faithfulness as dad and mom and, uh, and pastor and teachers and family. But it shows we shouldn't put our trust in man in the flesh, that it, it, in human arm, that is. Even... The trust we put in our parents, in our husbands, in our wives, and our children, it should always come through the Lord. It's because we trust the Lord that we trust our husband, our wife, our family, our pastor, or anybody. And uh, the challenge is this, for as long as you see Christ in that person, trust the Lord in them. That's the safest way to put it. Because if the Lord departs, trust no man. So this is the safest way to explain it. But I said all these to come to the book of Numbers and say that was the main message we got out of the book of Numbers. Chapters 1 verse 1 from the book of Numbers. And the Lord spake unto Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tabernacle of the congregation, on the first day of the second month, in the second year, after they were come out of the land of Egypt, saying. So the Lord uh, had commanded a numbering of the people. And that was fine. And that was what should happen when the Lord uh, uh, commanded the numbering. If the Lord commands it, the numbering is blessed. If man commands it, it means he is trusting in the number. So, we, in the numbers, 
we should always trust in the Lord and remember the phrase uh, that uh, the anointed man of God said that Lord you're able to save with few and you're able to say with many but we saw David ordering, ordering and numbering and even his first man uh, military man he told him uh, forgive me king but we should trust in the Lord I mean are you sure you want to do that he received uh, so many warnings yet he didn't give heed to any warnings and he went forth and he uh, did the numbering. But the numbering David did was a numbering to trust in man and not in God. And this happens when we lose trust in the Lord. So it's more than trusting in man. It's, it's um, something beyond that. It is uh, losing our trust in the Lord thing that should never happen to us even in our greatest disappointments that's a lesson that in our greatest disappointments the lord should be our trust some trust in chariots some trust uh, in horses but we do trust in the name of the lord they are fallen but we are standing because of tr trusting in the Lord. Who falls? Those who trust in horses, chariots, military power, manpower, numbers, but not God. God can save by few or by many. The Lord is the Savior. That's the teaching. Now, let us go through the book of Numbers by just going through the main points the main analysis of the book of numbers and then we'll give some highlights from my personal notes and other notes chapters 1 through 9 is israel at sinai israel at sinai Chapters 11 through 19, it's Sinai to Kadesh. That's the journey of the people of Israel in the desert from Sinai to Kadesh. And chapters 26, excuse me, chapters 20 through 36, it's Kadesh, the trip from Kadesh or Kadesh to Moab. And more analytically, the contents in detail, Israel at Sinai, chapters 1 through 9. Chapters, two, one, chapters 1 and 2 deal with the counting of the people. Chapters 3 and 4 is the numbering or the counting of the priests and the Levites. Chapters 5 and 6 is the laws. Chapter 7 deals with the offerings of the rulers. Each ruler brought forth their offering unto the Lord. Chapter 8 is the dedication and the cleansing, the consecration and the cleansing of the Levites. Chapter 9 is Passover and the cloud of guidance. Passover and the cloud of guidance. Chapter 9. Chapters 11 through 19, which is the trip from, from Sinai to Kadesh. Chapters 10 through 19, we see the start of the journey, or chapters 10 and on. 
Then we see in chapter 11 the complaining and the memories of the past. Complaining and the memories of the past. How many of you remember this verse that says, let the women not speak at church, but ask their husbands when they go home? I was hearing a good teaching from a good professor. In fact, she was amazing. A woman professor at Osbury Theological Seminary. She was amazing in her whole analysis of uh, her subject. And when she came, and I noticed that she was using the NASB, New American Standard Bible, which you remember, I told you the story of the man that got the project to do the NASB, and he repented of his sins when uh, some of his um, co-theologians in, uh, had in, uh, warned him about uh, read the textus receptus before you go ahead and do the translation uh, of the NASB. Do that before you go on because you're missing words. You're missing verses. You're missing uh, even chapters. So after he had... Uh, read the Textus Receptus carefully and compared it with the Alexandrian manuscripts, then uh, he had repented of his, this great sin, but it was already too late because the NASB, NASB, New American Standard Bible, was already in the making and he couldn't cancel it. It was not up to him, but for as long as and for what, is what, for what it was up to him to do, he said, as for me and myself, for the rest of my life, I'll go from place to place and to tell everybody, go back to the Holy Bible. That, that is the King James Bible, which means the only Bible that doesn't miss a word. That's the basic thing to remember. King James Bible is the Holy Bible. It means it doesn't mean it doesn't miss a word, not a word. So he says, study from your final authority. King James Bible is the perfect Bible, the preserved Bible. For if you believe only in the inspiration of the scriptures and you don't believe in the preservation of the scriptures, you missed the whole thing and the doctrine of inspiration will not benefit you unless you got the doctrine and believe the doctrine of the, of preser the preservation of the holy scriptures. And so I heard that professor saying uh, after she analyzed everything perfectly, she came to the, that verse and he, she said that uh, this verse from the Nestle Island New Testament, which means Alexandrian manuscripts, now they are into the either the 27th edition or the 28th edition. And this is what is being studied, I can say, by all, not 98%, by all theological seminaries. That means, that means highest academic level of everyone preparing to become a pastor or a theologian. So what it means, these poor people are exposed to the wrong manuscripts and here we have a, someone that I uh, when I heard her and watched her do her class and give such an amazing lecture truly amazing professor everything was fine 
when she got, came to that point, she didn't have an explanation. So she said, well, that portion of scripture, as you see in the margins of your Bibles, or in the, or in the footnotes, um, or in the footnotes, you see, You see that it was not in the uh, it was not in the in the main manuscripts or, or something like that, and she explained it as the, as such. She said, um, she she said that um, well, the this is called an interpolate listen to such such um, an explanation interpolate and what does what this means in that kind of theological discussion she meant that out of turbulence got out of the marching and it was put in text You're blessed to be exposed to, have been exposed to the right manuscripts and to the right scriptures. So she said it's an interpolant, meaning a turbulence caused it to go from the notes into the text. And she referred to two commentators. So when you read a commentary on the Bible, don't take it as your final authority. The word of God is your final authority. Two of the commentators had said that, um, well, this doesn't sound like Paul the Apostle. Everything else sounded like Paul the Apostle except that one that verse so the conclusion was that a sleepy scriber in copying the manuscripts a sleepy scribe an uncareful scribe that was copying the manuscripts put it there because you see the manuscripts uh, when they were writing the manuscripts, the scribes wrote some notes in the margins. So somebody who was sleepy and put it in the text instead of leaving it in the margin. Listen to this explanation. And this amazing professor that gave such a good outline of her subject. And finally she comes to one verse. She doesn't have any explanation. She refers to two commentators. So she makes them her final authority. And she makes Nestle Island. Nestle is written as Nestle. Nestle Island. Critical edition. And somebody thinks, well, we came to the 27th edition, 28th edition probably by now. So the more, the best. And in every edition, they leave out things. That's the critical edition of the New Testament. They keep changing the New Testament every time. Then they change the modern versions. So modern versions take the N N I New, New International Version, NIV. Uh, this Bible which is not a Bible, we shouldn't call them Bibles. This translation, all of a sudden, uh, it's totally different in the, in the edition of the, of the 80s, 90s. There is another one uh, about 2011. And they, they completely change things in the same Bibles. The only Bible that doesn't change 
is the King James Bible, which is the Holy Bible. Now, even when you come to that point, hallelujah. Um, Ah, okay, if you hear somebody that says, well, um, the, uh, the King James Bible was different in 1611, different in, uh, the, there was another version in uh, 1625 around that year, and then there was another one in 1748, and then you know which one I prefer? And which one you should prefer? It's called Pure Cambridge. So I'm giving you an extra uh, piece of information so that you will never fall into any trap. Uh, it's the 1900, the year 1900, that's called the Pure Cambridge King James Bible, which means it goes back to the 1611 all of these versions are not different it's different spelling because spelling had changed so it's different spelling same words but the 1900s um pure cambridge is the most faithful to the 1611 so we don't use different versions it's the same one it's like when there was a typo error they took it back to uh, to do another printing and another version so they saw the typos it's not like the computing of today uh, that's why you don't fall into this trap and you find out there were different editions that were that these were different um, printings of the same Bible, but never changing the words or phrases. It's got all the words from the 1611. So, uh, as I've said all of these to say that even one verse is very important to us. To have a professor who is able to... Um, explain everything in their theological language they, they use the greek word exegesis we know exegesis and they say they use the verb exegete which somebody who doesn't know greek sounds very uh, unfamiliar so we promise that in this course we'll explain everything and since you're most of you are greek speakers you understand exegesis which means exegesis now uh, this one verse was not given an exegesis, an interpretation, because she said it was probably put there by a sleepy scribe. Yes, this might have happened to any other manuscript other than the Masoretic manuscripts and the King James Bible manuscripts. So you see where I come back to, it's very important for us to say that God, listen to this teaching of, of the day. If you don't remember anything, remember this that just came from heaven. If you don't remember anything else, God has ordered a numbering of the people in the book of Numbers and the Lesson we learned tonight is that God order, orders us, commands us to number the words of the word of God and say every word is important. So praise the Lord for our Bible studies, for the uh, for you being exposed to the right manuscripts the, you know you have the bible you know every word is the word of god we believe every word in the word of god 
Why couldn't this happen to the Masoretic text and to the text that underlines the King James Bible? Why? Which King James Bible is the Masoretic text of the Old Testament and the Textus Receptus uh, text of the New Testament manuscripts. Why couldn't this happen? Because if you study, you don't have to, but if you study uh, the Masoretic uh, text and the Masoretes, you will find out that the scrutiny, the scribes went uh, th under and through was so much thorough and in detail that uh, uh, if they miss not a word, if they miss a letter, they were supposed to count the letters and give each other the writings, the copies, crisscross them amongst them, then the overseer of the work would see and check everything. And this was done by the approximately 56 translators and about uh, seven different uh, working teams of uh, uh, the people who were used by God to uh, put down his word that we have in our hands today. There was a scrutiny of checking every single letter. So if they missed the letter, they were supposed to throw all their work, all of their work, of all the groups, and start again until all the teams came up with a final checking, crisscrossing amongst them, and then the final checking of the overseer of each team so they got everything right so there was not a sleepy scribe and there was not a verse called by a, a strange theological um, term so nobody understands sounds fascinating nobody understands interpolant verse what's an interpolant verse a verse a, a note of the scribes that was put uh, in the in the margins and since we are on the subject and i love this subject i'll tell you a, a something else that you may not have uh, in mind even though i believe that we we've covered it but the alexandrian manuscripts um, you can see them even you can check the ch check them on Google, uh, if you Google them and you do a research, you will find out that they even used lemon to make something look more ancient. That's what they used. Imagine, uh, you know, their craftiness. And that's why Paul the Apostle says, I don't want you to be ignorant of their evil devices. So, these people of the Alexander manuscripts many times erased and wrote over and underneath and above and in the margins. But not so with the, Mas with the Masorites. Nobody was supposed to put any comments. No adding or subtracting. These were people that I told you that when it came to the four-letter consonant uh, name of God, Yudhye they would stop, they would go wash their body from head to toe, change their pen, use red ink, write the name of God, go have a bath again, come back and continue. That's how much their reverence for the name of God was so we know they wouldn't mess with the text they did exactly what they were supposed to do copy the manuscripts so no comments on the manuscripts 
So today we are we are commanded to count the words. That's easy to get the discussion and the argument done. Oh, you use the King James Bible only. Of course we do, because that's the only Bible that has all the words of God in it. In, in the word of God in every other translation in every other language that has the underlined King James Bible text in their translation every other language as for as long as it is based on the preserved word of God so we shouldn't uh, believe in, in turbulent verses Never be confused. So anytime you hear this term, you will never ever be confused because you already are prepared. You are more educated than these students at that theological seminar. Specifically, it's a good seminary. It's called the Osborne Theological Seminary. But on that, I mean, poor students to tell you the truth, if I was part of that class and I had to go through the Nestle Island because that professor said next semester you're going to be dealing always with that underlying text of the Nestle Island 26th, 27th edition. So I would get up and leave the classroom and disrupting my studies because it's better to get out and get educated in whichever way you can. Thank God you, are, you can be educated from the beginning in the right scriptures. Amen. So we don't say this was an interpolant verse or the book of Numbers is an interpolant book. No. It's there. It's part of the canon. We learn a good lesson about it. We learn that we shouldn't trust. In fact, we read Psalms 118 verse 8, which is the exact middle of the Bible. It is better to trust in the Lord than put your trust in princes, in men, whatever their level is. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. But we, we will trust in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. They have fallen, but we stood. We, have, we, we, we are standing up. Why? Because we don't put our trust in horses nor in chariots not in man we put our trust in the lord and as i said many times love your husband as your husband not as your god god does not accept any competition love your wife as your life not as your god Love your children as your children, not as your God. Don't make anybody your God. It's perfectly right to love your husband, love your wife, trust your husband as your husband. Don't trust your husband as your God. Don't trust your wife as your God. Trust her as your wife. Meet everybody at their level. That's why in one point the Lord says, Love your husbands. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. And then it says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of my call. So, unless you hate, what, 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 what that means is not to hate because God tells you and I will give you another hermeneutical law and close with that. But remember that one extra hermeneutical law. And we'll explain it. We'll pick it up next time. 
when you exegete or interpret the word of God, you will have to decide when the content or the verses are, number one, situational or normal. They are either normal, normal, and they refer to and they speak to all believers, to all generations, all over the earth, ecumenical message, and the situational, which means somebody speaks very specifically to one person for one time. For example, Paul said to Timothy, uh, he sent a message to bring him, bring him his cloak and the membranes and the manuscripts in prison. So this message is situational and it's not to all believers to, of all the time all over the earth. It's not ecumenical. It was to one. But if it refers to a message to all, then it's to all of us. We will explain and learn when to take that. For example, you either love or hate, hate your parents. You love your parents because that's, that's the commandment that comes with a blessing and a promise. And the Lord says to love your parents. But then he says the, the teaching of hating is that never ever love your parents as your God. Love your parents as your parents. Love them. Love them to the extreme love you can get. Love them as your parents. Love your husband. Love your wife as Christ loved the church. That love lays down their lives for their wives. So you see, love your wife as Christ loved the church. Love your husband. Love your children as your children. Love each other as brothers and sisters. But never ever love any one of them as your God. In fact, tell them, as I told my children many times, it's because I love the Lord that I can love you. Tell your husband that. Tell your wife that it's because of the love of God in me that I can love you as my wife. I can love you as my husband. And I will go all the way in loving you as my husband. All the way as loving you as my wife. All the way as loving you as my children. All the way as loving you as my brother, my sister in Christ. But also go all the way in loving your God as your God. Still on Numbers 1-1, one, one, a great lesson. That's the teaching. Love your God as your God. Because if you truly love Him, you will truly trust Him. You will never do David's statistics, numbering of people, counting of people but you will trust in the Lord he can save by few or by many Amen